to the book of Romans chapter 5. I'm going to share some things with you during this weekend that I believe to be some of the most profound things in the Word of God and things that a lot of people don't have understanding of. And you know, there's a scripture in 2 Peter chapter 1 that says, All things that pertain unto life and godliness come to us through the knowledge of Him that has called us to glory and virtue. And I mean, that means all things in every area of your life. If you've got a physical problem, if you need healing in your body, you've got a knowledge problem. You don't understand something about what Jesus produced. I know there's a lot of people who disagree with that and say, oh, I know that, you know, by stripes we're healed, but you don't have a full revelation of it, the knowledge of what the doctor has to say, what is said on the television, on the news and different things, what Aunt Susie said about it when she had that sickness. Those things are more important to you than what the Word of God says. Somewhere you've got a knowledge problem because everything that pertains unto life and godliness comes through the knowledge of Him that has called us to glory and virtue. So I'm going to share some of the things that I believe to be the most profound, some of the most fundamental things that the Word of God has to say. And this is something that is not going to be real entertaining. I know a lot of people come to services because they want to be entertained. They want something exciting. They want uh, people running down the aisles or somebody shouting or running. And there's nothing wrong with those things in their places. But you know what? When you get sick and the doctor tells you you're going to die, it's not your excitement that is going to get you well. It's the knowledge of God. It's the truth of God's Word. And many people have just been entertained instead of educated. And I'm going to be sharing some things that are going to make you think. You're going to have to use your brain for something besides a hat rack. But I encourage you, it's going to be well, well worth the effort. Amen? Amen. So this may be a different form of ministry for some of you, but I think it'll be really beneficial. Matter of fact, there is so much in these few verses that I'm going to share that honestly, you could stay on this for weeks, weeks, weeks ministering. It's going to be hard for me to try and condense this and get it all into here. But the book of Romans is Paul's masterpiece on the subject of grace. And he taught effectively uh, from the Word of God how that Jesus totally changed everything and took away the condemnation of the Old Testament law. And I mean, it is profound. If the book of Romans isn't one of your favorite books, you do not have a good foundation in the Word of God. That's quite a statement, but I believe that's absolutely true. The book of Romans ought to be one of your favorite books because it is just cram-packed. And the fifth chapter is awesome. I hate to skip any of it, but if I don't skip it, I'll preach on it. So let me jump down to Romans chapter 5 and in verse... Man, I hate to skip any of this, but let's go to verse 14. It says, Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. I hesitate to put this in his context. I could preach on this for hours. But let me just say real quickly that in the first, the two previous verses, he said sin isn't imputed where there is no law. And he made a point that the law didn't come until nearly 2,000 years after the fall of Adam. So he's saying that in between the fall of Adam until the time that the law came, God wasn't imputing people's sins unto them. That is a radical statement. I've got an entire tape set entitled The True Nature of God. I've got a book on it that that's what that whole set is about. Romans chapter 5 verses 12 and 13. That is one of the most radical statements. It is completely contrary to religion in the way it teaches today radical concept. And I'm not going to preach on that in the name of Jesus. But if that's true, well then if God wasn't imputing sin, then how come people died before the law came? That's what this verse is saying. Nevertheless, people died, death reigned. Why? Because sin had a twofold effect. Sin wasn't only a transgression against God that brought his wrath and judgment, but sin also gives Satan an inroad into your life. Romans chapter 6, verse 16 says, 
Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants you are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. That's saying that when you yield to sin, you are yielding to the author of that sin, which is Satan, and you give Satan free access to you. So I call it a vertical and a horizontal effect of sin. Even though God wasn't bringing this vertical effect of sin, He was not imputing sin unto people. And I could just nearly preach on this. (laughs) But did you know Abraham married a half-sister, which according to Leviticus 18, if you married a half-sister, you're supposed to be put to death. It's a sexual abomination. Abraham did that, and yet he was the friend of God. God didn't impute that sin unto him. And then uh, Jacob came along and married two sisters, Rachel and Leah, while the other was still alive. According to Leviticus 18, that's a sexual abomination. You have to kill him. And yet he was a man who wrestled with an angel of God and prevailed and became Israel and the 12 tribes of Israel were named after him. God was dealing with people in mercy, not imputing their trespasses unto them before the law. If that was so, why didn't they... Why did people die then? Because even though God wasn't bringing His judgment on sin, sin was destroying the human race. Sin was opening up a door and Satan was coming in and destroying people. And so, it'll even say this in just a couple of verses, God added the law. In other words, that wasn't essential. It wasn't a part of the original covenant. The original covenant with Abraham was faith not law. And the law came 430 years later. God added the law to make sin so hateful, so odious, so bad that people would despair of ever trying to overcome their problems on their own and say, God, if this is the way you feel about sin, have mercy on me. And they would turn from self-righteousness and start receiving right standing with God by a gift. That was the purpose of the law. Not so you could keep it, but to show you how incapable of keeping the law you were so that you would quit trying to be self-righteous and you would throw yourself on the mercy of God. One of the slickest deceptions that the devil has ever put forth is to convince the modern day church that God gave all of the commands so that you could keep them and by keeping them, you would earn God's favor. That was never the purpose of the law. The purpose was never given to make you accepted with God, but rather to show you how far from being accepted with God you could ever be so you'd quit trying to earn it. Thank you for those few head nods. Some of you are thinking about that. And that's in that other set. That's the one on the true nature of God. Man, that's good stuff. So that's the reason that death reigned. Even though God wasn't judging it, Satan was destroying the human race because of the amount of sin. And so God had to give something that literally scared the devil out of people, and that was the law. And then in verse 15, it said, and well, let me say at the end of verse 14, he said, talking about Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come, And it says that Adam was a figure or a comparison to Jesus. Now, the reason I brought my computer up here, I want to read some of this to you out of other translations because the King James doesn't always uh, say this as clearly as some of these others. But, um, and let me just mention that if you aren't aware of this, I've got a a living commentary is where we, what we call it. And I've got over 17,000 verses that I've written footnotes on And um, this could really be a blessing to you. But let me read this to you in the Amplified in verse 14. This is Romans chapter 5, verse 14. Yet death held sway from Adam to Moses, the lawgiver, even over those who did not themselves transgress a positive command as Adam did. Adam was a type prefigure of the one who was to come in reverse the former destructive, the latter saving. So he's making a comparison, but he's making an opposite. It's a contrast more than a comparison. And then in verse 15, it says, but God's free gift is not at all to be compared with the trespass. His grace is out of all proportion to the fall of man. For if many died through one man's falling away, his lapse, his offense, Much more profusely did God's grace and the free gift that comes through the undeserved favor 
of the one man, Jesus Christ, abound and overflow to and for the benefit of many. So anyway, he's making a comparison. When he says that Adam was a similitude or a figure of him that was to come, he was talking about in the same way that sin and all of the results of sin, death entered the human race through Adam, life and righteousness and everything good comes through Jesus Christ. So they're alike in that sense, but actually opposite. One transgression produced all of the death and the decay that we see in the world today. And in the opposite way, God took all of the many, many millions of transgressions and through one person completely eradicated those. So there is a comparison, but it's actually an opposite type of comparison. Let me read to you the NIV on this. Um, That's not my favorite translation. (laughs) But... Nonetheless, here's what the NIV has to say about this. In verse 14, Nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even over those who did not sin by breaking a command as Adam did, who was a pattern of the one to come. But the gift is not like the trespass. For if the many died by the trespass of the one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many. And this is going to be repeated five times in these verses. You know, let me just share this with you, that when I, some of you have heard my testimony, but I was born again when I was eight. I became a religious Pharisee, not intending to. I just got into church and they taught me that God was going to love me and accept me based on my performance. And so I tried to perform better than anybody else. And I really did perform well compared to other people, but I got to trusting that God was going to love me based on my own performance. And then I had this miraculous encounter, March the 23rd, 1968, and God just showed up and God showed me what a hypocrite I was and how I was trusting in my own goodness. And he showed me his holiness compared to my holiness And I thought he was going to kill me. I hated myself. I saw the hypocrisy and stuff. And and it's a long story, but man, I, I just confessed everything I could think of, expecting God to kill me. And instead of killing me, I uh, experienced a supernatural love for four and a half months. I was caught up in the presence of God. It was awesome, but I was confused because I'd been taught my whole life that my God's acceptance of me was based on my performance. For the first time in my life, I admitted and recognized that my performance stunk, that I could not be self-righteous. And when I finally humbled myself and just admitted, God, I'm no good at all is when I experienced the love of God. It wasn't when I did something right. It's when I finally realized for the first time, everything I was doing was wrong. And it confused me. And praise God, I got drafted and sent to Vietnam Because in Vietnam, I just had to lock myself up with God. In 15 hours a day, I got to study in the Word. And that's where I began to start getting some revelation. And things began to start working in my life. But when I got back from Vietnam, I certainly didn't have the fullness of the revelation. And I remember that here I was. I knew God loved me. I knew it was not based on anything that I deserved. I didn't have the full understanding from Scripture, but I had experienced God's love at my lowest, not at my best. And I knew that His love had nothing to do with any goodness in me whatsoever. And so I knew that God loved me, but I didn't have the revelation of who I was in Christ and my identity in Christ yet. And when I got out of Vietnam, some of my friends, this this guy who's kind of my mentor, started taking me to these charismatic Bible studies. And uh, I was raised a Baptist. And man, I had a lot of prejudice against a lot of things. One of them was a woman teaching. I didn't think women could teach. It was wrong for women to teach. And so anyway, he took me to a Bible study where this woman was teaching. (laughs) So I came in with a chip on my shoulder. I was already convinced that this was probably of the devil just because a woman was teaching. (laughs) And then this was back about 1971 or something like that. And uh, 
I was in the Baptist church and if a man's hair touched his collar, he went straight to hell. He did not pass go. He didn't collect $200. It was just an automatic trip to hell if you, if your hair touched your collar. And when I got there, not only was a woman leading the Bible study, but there were hippies there with hair like dairy. <laughs> they had hair down to the middle of their back. And I just was like, oh God, what am I doing in this place? And then they started their Bible study. And in their Bible study, they were talking about being righteous. And oh man, I just had taken about all I could take. And so I whooped out my two or three scriptures. There is none righteous. No, not one. All of your righteousness is like filthy rags. And I whooped my scriptures out and put them all in their place. And I was waiting on them to fight back and get offended. And did you know the scripture says that you'll know them by their love one for another. These guys didn't get mad at me. They were just as kind. They operated in the love of God. And they started speaking to me. And for every scripture I quoted, they quoted 10 scriptures about being the righteousness of God completely as a gift, not according to your performance. And man, it just, it knocked me off balance. I didn't have a clue what to say. And I remember I was so impressed with their, how could they know the word? They had long hair. It was impossible. (laughs) This just really messed up my whole theology. And, and it embarrassed me too because I had been in church my whole life and I was supposed to know the Word of God. And So anyway, what I did, I went home and I bought a Young's Analytical Concordance. I don't know if any of you ever used that. But I bought a Young's Analytical Concordance and I looked up every word, in, every time in the Bible that it used the word righteous, righteousness, righteousness is... And there's thousands of them. And I looked up every single verse over a week's time. I fasted and prayed and spent 15 to 16 hours a day looking up every verse, writing those verses down. And at the end of that week, I was convinced that I was righteous. Not because I felt it, not because I had lived holy, but I saw what the Word of God says. And I was just... Intellectually, I embraced it, but in my heart, I couldn't embrace it because I had been taught my whole life that I was unrighteous. And anyway, I say all of that to say that these verses right here, after I had seen this truth, these verses are the straw that broke the camel's back. These are the verses that just revolutionized my life. I've never gotten over it. This is how the Lord finally got this truth through to me through these verses right here. So he's talking about, look at this in the 15th verse, but not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one, many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ hath abounded unto many. That is some of the most radical statements in the Bible. I don't know if you get that or not. That's awesome. In verse 16, and not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. You know, there's a reoccurring theme here. And again, I'm trying not to preach everything I know about this, but but this is an awesome statement right here. Most people think that the reason they are unrighteous is because of what you have done. And some of you have lived a really rotten life. Some of you have done some things that are really bad. And because of it, you just feel like, how could God ever use me? You know, when we give the testimony about Hannah being healed, most of you just applauded and praised God. You believe that. If you didn't believe that God does miracles, you wouldn't come out here to a a hotel on a Thursday night to listen to a hick from Texas preach. You know what? You are an absolute stark, raven, mad fanatic. You aren't the nod to God crowd. You believe in the supernatural power of God, and that's why you're here. And if I said, how many of you believe that God could raise somebody like Hannah up? Man, you're just right there. Amen. And if somebody came up and says, man, I I have problems, you would be saying, pray for her. Man, you'd believe God. But you know where I could lose the vast majority of you? 
I say, all right, if you believe it, you come up here and pray for him. And all of a sudden, some of you who don't have a doubt that Hannah was healed, you don't have a doubt that I could pray and see somebody healed. I say, all right, you come pray for him. And all of a sudden, your faith turns to fear. Your excitement turns to dread. What happened? What changed? Did you believe that God quit? No, but it's because you relate God flowing through you to your own righteousness, to your own goodness. And you may think I'm holy. You ought to ask my wife. (laughs) The only reason people have more faith in my prayers than they have in their prayers is because they know them better than they know me. If you knew me as well as you know you, you wouldn't have any more faith in my prayers than you got in your prayers. You know what? I don't get anything from God because I deserve it, because I'm holy. It's not based on my goodness. But see, you know your unrighteousness. And most people think that, oh God, how could you love me? Because look what I've done. These verses, it says it five different times. It'll say it over and over and over. God was was upset with the human race and separated from us, not because of what you did, but because of what Adam did. Adam's the one that made you a sinner. Adam's the one that made you live in death. And all your actions did was confirm that you had his nature on the inside of you. Now your actions have a lot of impact when it comes to relating to other people. And I'm not saying that your actions are unimportant. But when it comes to God, it was not your actions. It was the sin nature that separated us from God, not your sins. Your sins came as a result of having a nature that was separated from God and dead in trespasses and sins. Your sin didn't make you have a sin nature. Your sin nature made you sin. That's a huge difference. And this is what it's saying over and over. Death entered into this world, not because of what you did, but because of what Adam did. You were born a sinner. David said in Psalms chapter 51, in sin did my mother conceive me. That's not talking about that she had an adulterous relationship. That's talking about all of us were born in sin. A baby is born with a sin nature. You do not have to teach a child to lie, to steal, to be selfish. A child comes by it naturally. Here's a little parenthetical phrase in Romans chapter 7, which it deals with all of these things. I'm just not going to be able to cover this in five sessions. But in Romans chapter 7, it says, I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. Sin was already present. A baby is born with a sin nature, but it's not imputed unto you until the law comes, until you knowingly transgress. And then when you sin is not when you get a sin nature, that's when your sin nature is held against you. If a child dies prior to this time when they knowingly transgress the law, God is not imputing their sins unto them. You can see that with David's son who died. He said, I'll go to him, but he won't come back to me. Anyway, I say that to say, some people are saying, well, are you saying that a baby would go to hell because it has a sin nature? No, because it's not held against you until you knowingly cooperate and, and intentionally violate the commands of God. At the moment you do that, sin doesn't come. It says sin revives. It was already present. It revives. And from that time forth, if a person dies after they knowingly have transgressed against God, then that sin nature is held against you. But it's the sin nature that separates you from God. You were born in trespasses and sin. And if you understand this, it really makes a lot of difference Because the person who says, but you just don't understand how bad I've been. Well, you don't understand what it was that offended God. It's not your individual actions of sin. It's this singular sin. I'm trying to be disciplined, but I'm not doing very well. Let me drop down here. Go down to the 21st verse. And I need to read this... um, footnote that I have here. Is it the 21st? Yeah, here it is. It says uh, in the King James, let me get back over here to the King James. It says that as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ, our Lord. Here is an amazing fact. If you can understand what I'm saying, now this is going to take a little bit of effort on your part. 
you're going to have to use your brain. But listen to this. This is important. The word that was, uh, the word sin was translated from is, I'm not even going to try and pronounce this because I'm, I'm not very good at all this stuff. But anyway, I've got it written down here. If you want to find out, I can tell you later. But this word is used, the Greek word is used 45 times in the book of Romans and translated sin, S-I-N, 45 times. Four times it's translated sins, plural. But this word is a noun and not a verb. Now that is really important because a noun is describing a person, place, or a thing. A verb is describing an action that a person, place, or thing, a noun does. So this word is a verb and it's translated sin, singular, all but one time in the book of Romans. Romans chapter 3, verse 25. And the point I'm making here is that when the scripture says that sin reigned unto death, this isn't talking about your actions produced death. This is talking about sin, the sin nature, your propensity for sin, your, your spirit before you got born again. It ruled is what the word reign means. Matter of fact, I've got that written down someplace. Let me look this up. Here's what the word reign means according to the American Heritage Dictionary. It is, when it's used as a uh, noun, it means the exercise of sovereign power, dominance, or prevalence. When it's used as a verb, it means to exercise sovereignty, to be prevalent. When it says that sin reigned unto death, it means it dominated, it controlled, it was prevalent that death worked. And again, the word death here isn't talking about only physical death. The Bible says in Romans 6, 23 that uh, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Death here is not talking about just physical death. Did you know sickness is a result of sin? Anything that comes as a result of sin is death. Sickness is death. Poverty is death. Depression is death. Grief is death. An ungodly anger is death. Anything that came as a result of the fall. And so when it says it's sin, this isn't talking about your individual actions, but it's talking about this sin nature, this, this part of us that was, was birthed, separated from God. And Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3 says, We were by nature a child of the devil, even as others before you get born again, you have a nature, a spirit that is separated from God. And the reason you commit actions of sin is because you have this sin nature. A dog acts like a dog because it's a dog. You can dress a dog like a horse. You could treat it to do some things. You could put a saddle on it, but you know what? It's a dog. You can treat, you can, you can take a pig and you can uh, you know, clean it up and put perfume on it and paint its toenails and put a ribbon in its hair. But you know what? It's a pig and it'll go lay in slop because that's what pigs do. And yet you can take other animals that are so clean like a cat. Man, it would never live in a pig sty the way that a pig does. You know what? Because it's got a different nature. Whether you understand it or not, it is not your individual actions that separated you from God. It was this sin nature that separated you from God. You were born with it. And the reason you committed sin was because it was your nature to sin. And the law restrained that nature. It didn't change your nature. All it did was make you fearful that you were going to be punished or judged. And so you can get behavior modification through giving people laws and telling them to do certain things, but you can't change their life through laws. You can't change a person's heart. You know, we're in a political season and man, morality is a big deal. And I believe we need to elect officials that will produce godly morals. The Bible says that righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. And so I believe that we need to elect people who will do the right things and do things according to the word of God. But I can guarantee you that if we depend only on government to dictate what is right, and just start passing laws. And if we were to just right now, like outlaw all homosexuality, all abortion, all adultery, and if we passed laws and outlawed it, did you know what would happen? We'd have a civil war in this nation because people's hearts aren't right. 
That's not, I don't, I'm not saying we shouldn't do those things and we shouldn't have righteous laws, but I'm saying that is not the way to do it. You've got to change people's hearts. The reason our nation is going the direction that it's going is because people are more concerned about, you know, all of these other things than they are about godly principles. And therefore they are voting in ungodly people that are leading our nation because they aren't, uh, their relationship with God is not paramount. If we really want to change this nation, you need a two-prong approach. You need moral, godly people in leadership. But the real answer is the church preaching the gospel and getting people's nature changed. That's where our power lies. Amen. And so anyway, people were by nature a child of the devil. So when it says sin reigned unto death, that is not talking about your actions. That's talking about this sin nature your corrupted, fallen human nature dominated, prevailed, reigned unto death. Not talking about only physical death. It includes that. But sickness, disease, poverty, sadness, depression, all of those things came as a result of this sin nature. That's what it's talking about. So this is when it's talking about this uh, Greek word here, it is not talking about your individual actions of sin. It's talking about this sin nature. So your sin nature dominated, prevailed, controlled your life through uh, unto death. And it says in the same way might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Did you know nearly every word in this sentence has been so twisted that people don't understand what these words mean. Some of you may not understand what I'm saying, but I'm just saying from my standpoint, my own personal life, I had to renew my mind and the people I talk to, 90% of the people will read this wrong. When it says sin, they'll think about their individual actions of sin instead of their sin nature. When it says death, they will think about physical death instead of depression, discouragement, sickness, poverty, etc., And then when it says grace, most people don't fully understand what the true grace of God is. Man, I teach on that a lot. And it says grace reigns through righteousness. Most people, when it talks about righteousness, they think about self-righteousness. They think that this means I've got to be right. I've got to start doing everything right. That is, that's the opposite of what this is talking about. And then it says unto eternal life, which I have a whole teaching on eternal life. And most people think eternal life is living forever. That's not eternal life. Everybody lives forever. The devil lives forever. Hitler's living forever. Well, people say, well, it's living forever in heaven instead of in hell. No, the Bible says now we have eternal life. Eternal life, according to John chapter 17, verse 3, Jesus was praying right before his crucifixion in the garden. And he said, Father, this is life eternal that they might know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Eternal life is not living forever in heaven. Eternal life is an intimate, personal relationship with God. And here's what grace reigns. That means it is prevalent, dominant. It rules through righteousness right standing with God by faith and not by works. Let me share these verses with you out of Romans chapter 10. I don't know if you're paying attention, but nearly every verse I've quoted is out of the book of Romans. This is what the book of Romans is all about. This is powerful stuff. And Paul said this in Romans chapter 10, verse one, brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. That verse shows that there are two kinds of righteousness. There is a righteousness that is from God and then there is your own righteousness. Another way of saying that, is that there is a self-righteousness and then there is a, a righteousness that comes from God that Romans chapter five says it's imputed unto us. 
2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21 says it's imputed unto us. Colossians, uh, Corinthians chapter 1, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30 and others. It's an imputed righteousness or a, a faith righteousness. There are different types of righteousness. And over there in Romans chapter 5, verse 21, when it says that grace reigns through righteousness unto eternal life, talking about intimate relationship with God. This is just a concept that the average Christian does not have. Those words just mean different things to them. But this is what I want to try and explain this week. Grace is God's unmerited, unearned, undeserved favor. And like I was giving my testimony earlier, I had an encounter where I experienced God's grace. And I knew that God loved me not based on what I did, but based on just the fact that He's loved, not that I'm lovely. And so I understood grace by experience. I didn't have the doctrine down, but I had experienced the grace of God. And I understood the grace of God to a degree. But did you know that grace reigns through righteousness? And I did not have the power of God's grace operating in my life because I didn't understand righteousness. You have to understand these things. And this is talking about, just like this is talking about, that there are two types of righteousness, not a self-righteousness. This is the only way I ever interpreted the word was just my own actions. I had to be good. But there is a righteousness that comes by faith. And that's what this is talking about. Let me go on and read the next verse here. In Romans chapter 10, verse 4, it says, For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. So no longer are we in, in right standing with God. That's what the word righteousness means. We are right with God, not through our own actions, but through what Jesus did. And when you put faith in a Savior, you become righteous through what He did for you, not what you do. Your righteousness is not based on your actions. And if you don't understand that, grace cannot reign. It can't rule. It can't produce its life until you understand that you are in right standing with God through what Jesus did and not through what you do. That's an awesome statement. That is just powerful. So anyway, let's go back to Romans chapter 5 and let me try and read through all of these verses to the end of the chapter and then I'm going to come back and comment on it. Romans chapter 5, verse 14. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one, talking about Adam, many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. What is the gift? Well, some people would say, well, it's the forgiveness of sins or it's salvation. In context, I'll show you in just a couple of verses, the gift is talking about the gift of righteousness, right standing with God. In verse 16, it says, And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift, for the judgment was by one the condemnation, But the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. Notice again, it's linking these two things together. You've not only got to understand the grace of God, but then you've got to understand what the grace of God did for you how it changed you and made you righteous in right standing with God. You've got to be able to understand that. And very few Christians understand that they are righteous with God. Man, that is awesome. So where did I quit? Verse 17. And then in verse 18, it says, Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, talking about Jesus, 
the free gift, that free gift, according to verse 17, is righteousness, came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. You were made righteous through the obedience of one, not through what you do. It's not what you do that makes you righteous and in right standing with God. Jesus made you righteous. There is a righteousness that comes by faith and then there is a righteousness that you produce by your own actions. Your self-righteousness is important and it's essential in getting along with other people. But when it comes to God, it's worthless. God does not evaluate any of us based on our own self-righteousness. It's only based on what one did. One person, Jesus, made you righteous. And if you come before God in your self-righteousness, promoting yourself and talking about, God, I fasted and I've prayed and I'm going to church and I'm paying my tithes and I'm doing this and this and this, now will you move in my life? God will not answer those prayers. If he gave you what you deserved, you'd go to hell. And some of you think, oh, you don't know how good I am. (laughs) You don't know how good God is. God doesn't grade on a curve. He doesn't take 99.9% and say, man, you're so close. I'm going to go ahead and give it to you. You've either got to be perfect, which is impossible, or you need to have his righteousness imputed unto you. And you stand on what he did and not based on what you have done. It can't be a combination of the two. So that's what that verse uh, 19, for if by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. You know what? You didn't do anything to make yourself a sinner. Some of you again have this concept that, oh, I'm a terrible sinner because of what you did. What you did is a result of your sin nature. You were damned before you ever started acting the way you did. I know some of you, that's a new wrinkle in your brain and you think, no, that's not so. But that's what these verses, I don't know how you get around this. This just says, by one man, death entered. By one man, condemnation came. By one man, judgment came. And likewise, by one man, Jesus came forgiveness, justification, righteousness, freedom, and liberty. You know, the reason this is so important is because if you can identify yourself as being in Adam and that you were born in trespasses and sin, and it's not your actions that made you separated from God, it was this sin nature that you were born with. If you could accept that and accept that I was just born separated from God, well, then that means that in the same way as you didn't do anything to make yourself a sinner... You just inherited it. Well, then in the opposite direction, you don't do anything to make yourself righteous. It's not based on your goodness. You just receive it in Jesus. This is why the new birth is absolutely essential. You know what you did to become a sinner? You got born. You were born a sinner. You were born into sin. And then... Like again, a little tiny baby, they're selfish. I mean, they're innocent and they're cute in a lot of different ways, but you know what? They're selfish. They don't think about other people. You could bring a baby into this meeting tonight and I guarantee you a baby doesn't know that anybody else exists. They don't care that people are here trying to hear the word of God and maybe somebody's life hangs in the balance and man, they need to be healed. And they don't care about anybody. They think they're the center of the universe and they would just cry and throw a fit and make a scene and and disrupt the entire service and not think a thing about it because they don't know that anybody else exists. They are the center of the universe. And you know what? They just are selfish. They just think about themselves. They'll throw a fit. You don't have to teach a kid to go steal a toy from their brother or sister. You have to teach them just the opposite, that you know what you need to share. It's more blessed to give than to receive. Some people have never thought this through because babies are so cute and so nice. But you know what? They they have a sin nature and and left to themselves, they will manifest that sin nature. They will fight. They will do things because that is their nature. We were all born that way. And if you can accept that, 
All you did to get that sin nature was be born. Now, all you do to receive right standing with God is to be born again. And when you get born from heaven, you don't deserve to be the righteousness of God. Many of you, your actions haven't totally changed. If you got truly born again, there should be some evidence of it, but it's proportional to how much you renew your mind. None of us are doing everything perfectly. And so none of us are perfectly acting right. The only thing that made you righteous is the fact that you got born from above. When you got born from above and you got a new nature, that old sin nature left. And you have a brand new nature. Now, I just stepped on somebody's religion right there. Many of you think, now, wait a minute, I've still got that old sin nature. No, you don't. If I can talk fast enough during this week, I'm going to teach on this and show you that you don't have a sin nature. You had a sin nature, but when you got born again, your sin nature is gone. It is crucified with Christ. And it doesn't have the power of resurrecting every morning. You don't have a sin nature that drives you to sin anymore. Some Christians say, but I still sin. Well, I'll explain to you why you do it, but it's not because it's your nature to anymore. This is major, major. I tell you the things I'm saying, I, I just feel like in a sense, I'm dumping too much on you all at one time because very few people think this way, but most people don't understand they inherited sin. They didn't cause it. They think that they have to live righteously on their own. It's self-righteousness that most Christians are trying to attain instead of understanding that when you got born again, you were given righteous. You were made righteous. Man, keep your finger here. I'm going to eventually get to the end of Romans chapter 5. But look in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Second Corinthians chapter five, verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Did you know that that is not talking about that all of your old habits pass away, that you won't be mean and bitter anymore. You won't lie. You won't cuss. You won't do this. Now, Those things should happen, but that's not what this is talking about. When it says old things are passed away, this is talking about that sin nature is broken. It's gone. And if you renew your mind, it's not an automatic process, but if you renew your mind, you can have all of the old actions and thoughts and problems leave. But that is conditional on how you renew your mind. Romans chapter 12, verse 2 talks about you're transformed by the renewing of your mind. It's not automatic. It's, it's conditional. But old things, this old nature passes away and all things are become new. Again, that's not talking about in your physical body and in your mind because that doesn't happen. You know what? We will have people born again here tonight. But when they confess Jesus and they get born again and it says old things pass away, all things become new, their body's not going to change. If you were a woman before you got saved, you'd still be a woman. If you were a man, you're still going to be a man. If you were fat, you'd still be fat. If you were ugly, you'd still be ugly. You know what? Your physical body doesn't change. This is not what it's talking about. And it's not talking about just your soul, your mental, emotional part, because if you were stupid before you got saved, you'll still be stupid after you get saved. You know what? You still will have your same memories, your same personality, All of those things are the same. But in the spirit, the part of you that was the nature, you were trapped. And by nature, you were a child of the devil. When you make Jesus your Lord, your nature gets changed. Old things pass away and your spirit becomes totally, totally and completely brand new. Man, that is awesome. And then in verse 18, and all things in the spirit are of God who hath reconciled us unto himself by Jesus Christ and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation to wit, or that's old English for saying that is that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. Man, that is one awesome passage of scripture. 
the church as a whole today is imputing people's trespasses unto them and saying, if you do this, God won't do this. If you do this, God doesn't love you. God's angry. God's upset. This is why he hadn't answered your prayer. He's holding your sins against you. But Jesus came not imputing men's trespasses unto them. God does not hold your sins against you. You know what? That's the reason I have to rent a room like this to preach. It's because I can't say this in most churches. Did you know 99% of all churches will kick me out for saying something like that? The church as a whole is imputing men. If you
Ponte 